West Terrace Cemetery is an irregular shaped 68 acres of burial ground in the Adelaide Park lands. Laid out when the city was surveyed in 1837 as a circle of 32 acres, its area was added to over the years, during which about 150,000 people were buried there. In its grounds are the full gamut of society, from ostentatious monuments to leaders of society to unmarked paupers' graves. While many stories end here, including that of the Somerton Mystery Man, victims of murders solved and unsolved, and noteworthy people from the past, other stories take place here. During the daylight hours, when the sun is high and bright, the cemetery has the pleasant feel of a park, full of aged trees, rare remnant vegetation from pre-settlement days, and Victorian-era varieties of flowers blooming between the graves. At night the cemetery is closed, but the shadows are dark and foreboding. The homeless have long sought refuge here, hunkering down in concealed places to sleep. The first crematorium in the Southern Hemisphere opened here in 1903. A dead sheep was the first to be cremated here as a trial run. The first person cremated here was Bishan Singh, a young Sikh man who operated a drapery business in Hindley Street, who died suddenly of natural causes, aged 30, on the 2nd of May 1903. Public interest was so intense that a few hundred people arrived to witness the events from outside, and a newspaper published a photograph of the skeleton in the furnace. The crematorium closed in November 1959, and was demolished ten years later. Only the underground furnace remained, which was backfilled with debris and covered with dirt and turf for decades. It was exposed again in 2005 by an archaeological dig. Stolen goods have been concealed there. On the 28th of September 1922, Constable Driscoll noticed something white near a tomb. On checking, he found a bundle of baby linen hidden in an opening of a vault. The linen, worth five or six pounds, was thought to have fallen from a laundry cart on West Terrace. Amongst the darker events are the disposal of unwanted children here. It was once not uncommon for the bodies of newly born children to be discovered in out-of-the-way places. Sometimes the babies were found in or near the cemetery. On the 29th of June 1903, a stonecutter on his way to work found a parcel laying at the back of the cemetery. Suspicious of what it may contain, he notified police. They discovered the body of a newborn baby boy. How the infant had died wasn't obvious, and the inquest declared that the unnamed baby had been found dead, and the matter closed. Another dead baby boy was found in an outbuilding at the cemetery, early on the morning of the 22nd of April, 1922. It was thought this child was stillborn, and no inquest was held. On the 30th of May 1944, a grave digger decided to look in a tin which had been left in the cemetery for a number of days, and discovered a tiny body. Police were going to check if the baby was stillborn. Nothing more was ever said about it publicly. Attitudes have changed, and a memorial was constructed for the stillborn and very young babies who were buried in the cemetery in 1996. Approximately 30,000 of them were placed in unmarked graves from the 1830s to the 1980s. The tiny bodies were buried in cardboard coffins, up to 20 of them together in one plot at the back of the cemetery. While some came to leave their babies, others came to end their lives here. At least three suicides were committed in the cemetery. The first occurred on the 1st of November 1872 when a man named Henry Stanford was found hanging from a fence, kneeling on the ground with a handkerchief around his neck in the evening. He had been drinking in the Elephant and Castle Hotel across the road in the afternoon, and seemed to be despondent. His brother at the inquest said that Henry drank a lot and was often depressed. When he was found, it was George Jolly, the proprietor of the hotel, who came with a knife to cut the man down. Although the body was warm, Stanford could not be revived. A doctor pronounced death from strangulation, and he was found to have committed suicide whilst temporarily insane. Stanford is buried in an unmarked grave, between the graves of some of the most important members of early Adelaide society. The next man is also in an unmarked grave, 
but in the pauper section on the fringe of the grounds. James Wright was a 51-year-old bachelor with no relatives in Australia. He had boarded at David Street for almost three years and was considered a sober man who never gave any indication of wishing himself harm. Yet on the night of the 10th of September, 1881, he told his friends he was going to the opera. Before 9am on Sunday morning, a man walking in the cemetery found Wright apparently asleep on the ground, but noticed blood trickling from his ear. Police were called and Lance Corporal Preston found a revolver under the body and a bullet wound in the head. He left a note saying a reliable friend had turned against him and that he was running low on funds. He had also hurt his back some time before he came to Adelaide. He left three pounds to pay for his burial, his personal goods to three friends, and his tools were to be sold and the money donated to the Free Thought Society, a group which believes in using logic and reasoning, rather than authority and tradition, to form opinions about religion. On the 12th of April 1911, Walter Pierce Jones, from Ballarat, Victoria, went to the cemetery and shot himself. The gunshot was heard about 1.10pm and a few minutes later a gravedigger found Jones lying on Road 1. He was taken to the morgue and identified from papers he had on him, although no note explaining his action was found. Jones was a remittance man who received £250 per annum in weekly instalments, but had been ordered to pay his wife £40 in support by the court in Victoria and was worrying about raising the money. A remittance man was somebody who was paid to emigrate from England to far-flung places like Australia, on the understanding that they did not return home. Usually some scandal that had shamed a wealthy family was the reason behind such arrangements. While attitudes could be harsh in 1911, it is still shocking to see the Coolgardie Miner, a Western Australian newspaper, in its story used in the headline, A considerate suicide died in the cemetery should save cartage costs. Jones was buried in the cemetery, not far from where he ended his life. The back end of the cemetery is a lonely place, even today, and unsavoury events have no doubt taken place there. People living in Adelaide would take their cows to the parklands to graze until the 1950s. In 1917, a 12 year old girl was tricked into following a man who told her her family's cow would have to be pastured in a new area and that he would show her where that was to be. He took her to the cemetery and there threw her to the ground. With his hand on her throat he warned, if you murmur I'll choke you. Then he put his hat over her eyes and cautioned that if she removed it he would kill her. She began to cry which he told her to stop or he would take his knife out. While semi-conscious from shock he raped her leaving her with severe injuries. After he left, she was able to summon a gravedigger to help her. The perpetrator, Robert James Rowan, a short man aged 34, was quickly identified and arrested. He already had a bad record, being convicted of bag snatching, theft and perjury, and had spent time inside. He also had three children of his own, the eldest a girl of 11. Said by the judge, Sir George Murray, to be unfit to be loose, he was sentenced to be imprisoned with hard labour for the term of his natural life. Had the crime occurred in New South Wales at the same time, he would have faced the death penalty. As it was, he served 23 years and was released in 1940. He moved to Melbourne where he proved the judge in his trial correct. He wasn't fit for society. In 1942, he sexually assaulted a 68-year-old woman for which he received 10 strokes of the birch and four years jail. He died at Carlton in 1955. Murder too has visited the cemetery. Pasquale Esposito, a 53-year-old opal miner, shot dead his estranged wife Mary, 38, and his 72-year-old mother-in-law, Giuseppe Lopresti, with a shotgun in front of the couple's three teenage children on the 2nd of November, 1997. In 1998 he pleaded guilty and was given two life sentences and a 21 year non-parole period. He died in prison 23 years later on the 10th of February 2020. Both women are buried in the cemetery where they died. A morgue was constructed in the grounds of West Terrace in 1886. 
The building was used until about 1978, although complaints about rotting fixtures and unhygienic conditions were being voiced as early as 1908. Alexander MacDonald was a 26-year-old ostler at the stables attached to the Windsor Castle Hotel in Franklin Street. He appeared to be unsteady for a couple of days, and when he collapsed in the street one night, it was thought a punch had killed him. When the coroner came to examine him, the skin over the nose, cheeks and ears was missing, having been eaten by rats and mice in the morgue. It was finally deduced that MacDonald had died of natural causes. He had suffered a brain hemorrhage. With the morgue being in the grounds of the cemetery and isolated at night, terrible things beyond rodent attacks were likely to happen. On the afternoon of Saturday the 7th of April 1945, Mrs Charlotte Jane Jennings was playing tennis in the South Park lands near Hutt Street when she appeared to trip and fall to her knees. She stood up but immediately collapsed and died aged 54. Her body was taken to the morgue. During the night someone broke into the morgue. The break-in was discovered on Monday morning the 9th of April. The nude body of Mrs Jennings had been removed from the refrigerated shelf where it lay and placed on the floor of the morgue. Nothing further was done to interfere with the corpse, at least that was mentioned publicly. Nothing was stolen. The morgue was vandalised in December 1949, but although there were three bodies held there at the time, they were untouched. Police blamed boys for the intrusion. On occasion, homeless people would find a way in and sleep in the building overnight. However, somebody with more ghoulish intent broke into the morgue in September 1951. Gwyneth Joy Morgan was a 28-year-old woman preparing for her upcoming marriage. On the 22nd of September 1951, she went for a walk at the picturesque Moriata Falls to the east of Adelaide. What happened next is unclear. Gwyneth had recently had surgery and had taken annual leave to convalesce with her mother at Wakeree. She had been due to return to work at the post office the following Monday. She may have been experiencing doubts about her impending marriage, or it may have been a tragic accident. Gwyneth fell about 200 feet to her death. Police found her handbag on the clifftop with a note and other belongings within, including a heel broken off of woman's shoe. Her body was taken to the morgue. Sometime during the night, late Saturday or early Sunday morning, somebody broke a window three feet from ground level at the rear of the building. Once inside, they took the body of the young woman from its tray. It appeared from marks of dragging and bloodstains on an outside pathway that the body was taken out through the broken window and laid here. Using some sharp instrument, probably a razor, the intruder slashed the body, then having mutilated it, returned the corpse inside the morgue and lay it on the floor. There was a theory that two people had been involved and that the marks and blood outside were from one of the pair fainting when the other attacked the corpse and needed to be dragged out, involving one of them being cut on the glass. Police favoured the theory of a single deranged sadist being responsible. Whoever carried out the repulsive act remained unknown. Gwyneth was buried alongside her father at Wakeree Cemetery. Curiously, another strange incident occurred just 16 days later, on the 8th of October 1951. Men working at the Mile End Goods Yard at the back of the cemetery heard what they described as sounding like the agonising cry of a child in pain at about 2pm. They looked out of their office, but as a rail truck carrying sheep had just passed, and because it was school holidays, they put it down to either the sheep or children yelling as they played in the cemetery, as they frequently did. However, the same piercing screams were heard the next day at 10am. The men immediately began searching long grass between the railway and the cemetery, in case someone had been hit by a train and thrown there, but after 15 minutes could find nothing. They notified the railway's detective office, and soon a police search party was assembled which checked a rubbish dump near Hilton Bridge to the north, and a small creek which flowed through a ditch under the railway lines, and joined Keswick Creek nearby. After four hours they called off the search, without result. 
The source of the screams was never found. What could have made them? Children playing? Some unreported evil? Maybe ghosts reliving some of the dark past of West Terrace Cemetery. <laughs>